want to remind everybody, please turn your cell phones off. Okay. <laughs> and I even left mine in the car, so I wouldn't forget. But please turn your cell phones off. We are recording this. Uh, and uh, hopefully tomorrow, the next day, we will have this on DVD uh, for you to purchase. that will be $10. And we have all of our past speakers also on DVD. And we have those available if you'd like to pick up some of those tonight before you leave. A uh, lot of new faces in the crowd, and I'm real happy to see that. And I hope all of you signed in over there so that you can be on our uh, museum mail-out list. Uh, we'll be drawing tonight for a gift basket, so please don't leave before we draw. And also, I think Patty Oakley's going to come up uh, toward the end, and she's got a request, too, uh, for us at the end of the program. Also, the museum will be open. Uh, for about 30 minutes, 45 minutes after this program, if you have not been to the museum, I really urge you to go. You will be shocked if you've not been in there. Uh, you, I think Larry, Larry's here and Larry will run up there and open up the doors. Uh, but like I said, if you've not been in there, you'll be really, really surprised at what kind of museum that we have here in Minden. Uh, this is our fifth in the 2009 series. Uh, our next speaker will be Thad's sister, John Andrews Williamson. 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 And she will be telling uh, stories about her grandmother and her mother, which will be just really, really interesting. Uh, then our next speaker is uh, Dr. Wilkins in July. And Dr. Wilkins, uh, if you read the Minute Magazine, uh, the one that just came out, he has a story in there. He was 11 years old during the tornado of 1933, and uh, he's, he's got a really interesting story to tell, and so I hope all of you will come back and hear him. Uh, then in August, we've got a real special speaker. He's going to be telling uh, tales out of school, I think, and that's going to be Carlton Prothrow. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, so, uh, <laughs> and we'll be having a special auction that night of a dinner with Carlton. And uh, he's going to take uh, everybody that comes that night. I think you said to Ernest. <laughs> if they want to. <laughs> so y'all be sure to come back for August. Uh, in September, we have the Homer, uh, people from the Homer Museum will be coming, and they're going to be telling us um, about Claiborne Parish. And, of course, most of you know that at one time we were all Claiborne Parish, so they're going to be talking a little bit about that. Um, in October, we still have that spot open, and that will be our last for the 2009 series. Um, we've been doing a lot of work here lately in the museum, and you'll see some of that tonight in the back area, which is our theater room. Uh, Dr. Richard Breaker donated some painters for us uh, at our disposal here for about two weeks. And uh, if you ever try to paint those cases, you know that having some professional painters come in is, is just like a miracle. Just, I mean, they don't even have to put down drop costs, but they've done an excellent job at doing that. Uh, we estimate that rent is probably going to cost us, uh, what, sixty to $100,000 when we get finished with that rent. Uh, so if you're not a museum member, before you leave tonight, poor Lou, over there on that table where the hopper is, there's some brown cars. It only costs $20 to be an individual member. Everybody in Webster Parish can be an individual member. We hope that you'll want to be more than an individual member, but if $20 is all you can do, we'll, we'll take that. But we need everybody that's here and anybody you know to become a member of the Dorchy Historical Association Museum. Oh, uh, let's see. I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs>
Heffernight. Knight. Uh, and, and, and we're really uh, fortunate to have uh, Richard Knowles here to speak to us. But uh, as special uh, guests, I, I'll say, what we have uh, the three mayors of Homer, two of Heffer, that is. <laughs> uh, we have, have Lloyd Bailey, who was mayor of Heffer for 28 years, his son Stuart Bailey, and, and the current mayor of Heffer, Betty Blake. Let's give them all a big hand. start out as a teacher because she used to tell me that when they started out in the morning they had a person that took them to the schoolhouse and when they came back in the afternoon there was an escort that brought them back from the schoolhouse it was a pretty rough place and when they got home they didn't go anywhere else so she started teaching school in 1912 
And then she moved over to some of the little one-room schools in uh, Webster and Bienville Parish, schools that you, some of you may uh, recognize, Center School, uh, Adams Chapel, Adams, were some of the schools that she taught. And um, then she moved on up to uh, the new school at uh, Heffern. And uh, I used to hear my daddy talk about the new school in Heffern. It was opened in 1924. And this was part of the building program of Superintendent Bruce, who was one of the most progressive superintendents that uh, we've ever known. And uh, he closed a lot of the little one-room schools, and he built the uh, new schools. And there were schools built all over the parish, Heflin, Beverly, Sibley, uh, Sorrento, Shangaloo, and most of those schools stood until just a, just a few years ago. And some of you may have attended some of those. Uh, my daddy started school in uh, Heflin. Uh, he didn't start school there, but he entered school in Heflin in 1924. And he used to tell me <laughs> that when he entered the Heflin school for the first time, he thought he had died and gone to heaven because they had run him away. They had electric lights. They had bathrooms. Things that he did not have at home, and most other folks did not have at home. So he used to tell me that was a tremendous, great experience that he had back in 1924. And so what I'm going to share with you today, a lot of this came from this woman that I've just mentioned, Miss Amy Owens. And uh, she taught, began teaching in 1912. She wound up her teaching career in 1948. I was her last first grade class. So I probably wound her up in her <laughs> teaching career. Our story about Noah's Landing in the Hefling area, I want to go back and, and, and you know from what Carlton said, uh, I have to give you a little bit of history because uh, I was a history teacher for years at Menden High School and I see some of the people sitting in here that I had the privilege of teaching. It was a wonderful experience. But uh, the, the history really goes back to, let's start back in 1806. Uh, after the Louisiana Purchase, which the United States made in 1803 from France uh, for that huge figure of almost $15 million for a third of the United States. After they had made that purchase, they began to send out expeditions to find out what they had purchased. So they sent out an expedition, and this expedition left New Orleans in 1806. And it was commanded by a U.S. surveyor whose name was Thomas Freeman. And it was a party of 20 people. And they set out in two flat boats and a hero. And uh, two barges and a hero. They left New Orleans and headed up the Red River. They got past Natchitoches, stopped in Natchitoches, took on new supplies. And they got up to a point below Shreveport. They could go no further because of the Great Raft. The Great Raft, of course, which you're familiar with, uh, had the river completely closed off and you could not go any further. So thank goodness, they turned into a little bayou right below, right down below the Great Raft. And that bayou was known as Loggy Bayou. And then Loggy Bayou turned into another lake and uh, another stream, and the Indians, and he had two Indian guys on this trip, the Indians call that, that by you, the Cheat, D-A-T-C-H-E, what we know today as Bayou Door Cheat. And so, they came on down from Lager Bayou, and uh, then they entered uh, the uh, Lake Vistano, and the Indians had named Lake Vistano, they called it Big Frock because it was just full of debris and frock on top of the water. 
And so they came on into uh, Lake Mistino, door chief. And then they heard that the Spanish were coming. And the Spanish had gotten word of, of them coming up the red, and they had dispatched the force from Nacogdoches. And so uh, Mr. Freeman decided rather than take on the Spanish, he would uh, retreat back down to uh, he'd go back down to New Orleans. But he had discovered the place today that we call Loggy Bayou, uh, Lake Vistano, and uh, Bayou Door Chief. And so we're indebted to him for that. Now, my story begins tonight with a man by the name of, uh, his name was John G. Knowles. And he immigrated here from Georgia, Sampson County, Georgia. And he established, uh, this was in the 1840s, and he moved into a place called Sparta. Many of you know uh, where Sparta is. Sparta is over in uh, Bienville Parish. Bienville Parish had been made uh, a parish in uh, 1848, the year that Zachary Taylor was elected president of the United States, the only president that we have ever had from the state of Louisiana. So, John G. Knowles moved on into Sparta, and he was a planner, and he was a merchant, and he got into town politics. He was elected uh, as a selectman, and then later he was elected as a clerk of court of Bienville Parish. Now, Bienville Parish, keep in mind, at that time was a big parish, and took in part of Webster Parish, and Webster was created as a parish uh, in 1870 out of Bienville and Clayton. So Bienville was a very large parish at this time. Sparta was a thriving community. Uh, it had stores and uh, it, was a, it was a very, very thriving community. Sparta uh, continued on as, as the primary town in Bienville Parish up until the 1880s and 1890s. Then the railroad came to Arcadia and Sparta began to diminish. And the story is told, and I'm not sure this is true, but I'm going to fly might know, uh, but the story is told that in the middle of the night in 1892, a group of people came from Arcadia in wagons in the middle of the night and came to Sparta, and they loaded up all of the records in the courthouse and they carried them back to Arcadia, and Arcadia became the parish city. It's part of it was no longer a parish city. So, in the uh, John G. Knowles in the 1850s moved over to uh, a place on Lake Vistano and he established Knowles' Landing. And this was located, uh, of course, on Lake Vistano. Today it is at the end of the Yellow Pine Road, and some people call it the Port. Bolivar Road, and for some of us in here, you would recognize, uh, if I said Jimmy Dugan, Jimmy Dugan's camp, uh, that's where Noah's landing was, was located. And he established this landing, and he built a big commissary. It was just a big general store, and he built it out over the lake. And uh, he, uh, he, he, was a, he was a planter, he was a, he was a farmer, but he also had this big commissary. And he built a commissary out over the lake so it would be accessible to steamboats. And steamboats now came up, steamboats came up the uh, Red River into Lagi Bayou, it's particularly in the spring of the year, and they would leave their merchandise and then they would go back to New York. So John G. Knowles established uh, Knowles' Landing on Lake Vistano. And he built it at a place where it's probably in the most, the, the, the shortest distance uh, over to the other side, what I call the Doreen side. Today you can stand at uh, where Knowles' Landing was and you can look across Lake Vistano and you'll see Burgess Camp. And, uh, 
that's what uh, that's the reason he picked that place because it was such a short distance. He had a ferry that crossed the uh, Lake Vistano, and of course at that time that was the only way to cross Lake Vistano. There were no bridges, there were no railroad tracks, and nothing. The only way you had to cross was a ferry. And so he built this ferry, and it was just a big, large, flat boat, and of course I, I never saw it, but I'm sure it would accommodate several teams of, of uh, wagons and mules and horses, and they would, they would come over on the north side, and they would uh, get on this flat boat, and they would go over on the door cheap road, and then go wherever that they needed to go. So one of the ways that they, that they would have crossed the lake was that he strung a steel cable from Noses Landing all the way across to the Dolene side. And they would pull that barge across uh, the lake uh, by this steel cable. And they'd go from one side to the other. One of the ways that they had to know that there was somebody over on the other side that needed to go to the other side was that his his wife was a woman, and her name was Martha Jane Knowles. And it was her job to call the teams back and forth. And the way that they did this, this is something that was handed down to me. And I'm going to show you a good bit of stuff. But it's a priceless relic. And the way that, uh, that they would know to call the teams away to back on this side is that she would blow this horn. And I'm sure she was the one that did it because he was away doing other things. And the reason that I'm sure that she did it is because uh, when we get through, you can come up and take a close look at it. It has her initials on it, M.J. Knowles, card right there. And it has the date right under there, and the date is 1860 on this on this home. Now I won't blow it right now, but when we get through, we won't blow it for you. I want you to see how it sounded, and the reason that you could hear it all the way over on the other side of like this enough. But this is just one of the relics that my aunt Amy knows kept for years and years and years. And eventually she passed it on to me. And uh, I don't know what my girls are wanting or not, but <laughs> <laughs> John G. Knowles uh, went to the Civil War and uh, he. He joined a unit in the Bienville Parish that was called the Spartan Guards. It was a well-known unit in Bienville Parish. And uh, he saw action in uh, Northern Virginia, campaigns in Northern Virginia. And when the war was over in 19, 1865, uh, he came back home. And the stories that he told about getting back home were passed on to me through my Aunt Mamie. And she said that uh, he was, he told them that he had to walk, they had to walk all the way back from Virginia. There, there was no other, there was no transportation. Railroads were going up. All of these were burdened by horses. Everybody was dead. There was no other way that they just walked back. And people fed them on their way back because they would get dark time. People would feed them, take them in, take care of them send them on the way the next day. So I thought that was a very, very interesting fact. Um, he died in 1869. He didn't live very long after the, war, after the Civil War because he contracted dysentery. And dysentery was a disease that was, was incurable. And he passed away in 1869. They carried him to bury him. They carried him across the lake over to this place just north of Burgess Camp. And at that time, it was called Moscow, M-O-S-C-O-W. And it was the highest ground around. And that was the reason they had a cemetery there. 
it was a high strap that you could bury on. It would not flood when, when Lake Mississippi flooded in the spring. So they buried him there. And uh, my aunt told me that his family went back for many, many years until the 1920s or 1930s, and they tended the cemetery over on the Dolan side at Moscow. And then one time they went back in the in the 1920s, and people had taken the markers and thrown them into the woods, and they plowed up the cemetery and turned it into a field. Then, this is a, something that is very dear to me. Then, several years ago, I received a call from a lady in Orleans that lived down there. She lived at Moscow. She had a camp down there. She was a, she operated an insurance agency here in Minden. That was a, Low Blakely was her name. And she called me and she said, um, she said, Mr. Knowles, I have this huge stone in my yard. And she said, it's too big to move. And that's the reason it wasn't thrown away. Uh, they couldn't pick it up and move it. And she said, it's, it's this huge stone. And she said, it has the name John G. Knowles, and the date's 1824 to 1869. I said, Miss Blakely, I've been looking for that a long, long time. And I just hoped that somebody would, would, would tell me about that. So I went down there, looked at it, and it was this huge stone. And it just had his name and the date of his birth and, 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 and death. And uh, she says, you know, I, I can't move it. But she said, I, I'll just leave it here. And of course, I didn't want to move it because that was the place he was actually buried. Then a few years later, I got a call from a gentleman and he had purchased the property and he wanted to build a house where this big stone was. So I knew then that I had to move it. Well, all of John G. knows is sons and grandsons and all of us are buried at this one cemetery. So I went down there and it was heavy. I had to have help. <laughs> it was heavy. But we did pick up the stone and we got it on my pickup truck and we moved the stone to this one cemetery uh, because I didn't want it to ever just be thrown away. And we put the stone beside his son, that I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. And up on top of the stone, I just put in memory uh, CSA. And the stone is at this little secretary now. So I just want to tell you that, that story that, uh, of what happened to, to, uh, to him and to his stone. John G. left two young sons. Uh, one was my great grandfather. His name was William Lee Joseph Knowles. And uh, after after the Civil War, of course, you know, Reconstruction came, and these two young sons were just about 13, 14 years old, and they lost the place. They they, they lost the estate. And uh, but in 18 and uh, 75, he married my great great grandmother, and uh, she was a Reeves. Her name was Martha Jane Reeves, and he married her. And they they were deeded a a piece of property in 18 and 78, and that's the property that we live on today. And of course, we've added to it, but that is the property that that we live on today. And uh, I, this is also one of my things that I treasure. That's the original deed to the property, written out in longhand. Of course, there's a copy on, on file at the Arcadia, at the courthouse in Arcadia. But that is the original deed. And uh, the date on it is January the 5th, 1878. And for this 80 acres of property, they paid the huge sum of $300. $3.75 an acre. 
and they would bring it back to their to their farms on their wagons and teams, and they would shock it. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you put a big <coughs> pole down in the ground and you tie your hay around it, and uh, then when it rains, the water will uh, run off the top of the hay. Well, there was a man who owned property over on the Doyne side, and his name was Mr. Sapp, S-A-A-P. And later on, uh, I came to find out that that was Christine Hunt, Dr. Christine Hunt's grandfather. And uh, anyway, one day Mr. Sapp decided that he would fence off the hay land. He decided that was his private property, and he just put a fence around it, and and he wouldn't let anybody cut hay on it. Well, for years and years, that had been considered to be public land, and everybody had cut hay off of that. And so my great-grandfather went down there one day, he saw that fence, and he said, what are you doing? And he said, this is my land, and you can't cut hay here anymore. Well, to make a long story short, he went back, and he got with some of the other landowners, and they filed a suit against Mr. Sapp. And Christine and I had many, many laughs about this uh, 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 legal matter in our family. And uh, so anyway, the suit made its way through the courts and, and uh, made its way all the way to the Louisiana State Supreme Court. And in 1899, the Louisiana State Supreme Court decided that Mr. Sapp did not have the right to hands off that hand. And they, they ruled against uh, Mr. Sapp and he had to take his pants down. So uh, uh, Sapp versus Knowles, uh, that was the outcome of that uh, in 1899. Now I want to talk to you just a little bit about uh, the little village of Hefflin. I don't want to take too much time, but it's hard to stop. Uh, the village of Hefflin is... Uh, uh, has a long historical history, and uh, it was named for Mr. Charlie Heffern, and uh, he was one of the original settlers. And in 1900, the post office was located in Heffern, and uh, early uh, industry was a tanning industry, and uh, that was where they, they tanned hides, and there was a creek, and the creek still crosses 371, right down below Joe Bates' house. It was called Tan Yard Creek. And that's where the tanning bats were located, was on that creek. And that was one of the early industries of, uh, of, of the Heflin area. And uh, later on, we turned it into a swimming hole, and Tan Yard Swimming Hole, and that's where I learned how to swim. And I learned how to swim when my brother picked me up on the bridge across Tan Yard on 371, and he threw me out into the creek. And I learned how to swim. <laughs> Heflin, uh, has a, as I said, has a, has a, a very rich history. Uh, industry began to move into Heflin. Uh, Mr. Dallas and Mr. Louis Pace. There might be someone here that still remembers those gentlemen. I certainly do. Uh, they established a, a sawmill in Heflin in uh, 1914. And they kept this running. And in 1944, the sawmill was purchased by Water and Walker Lumber Company. And uh, I can still remember standing in my front yard as a little boy and seeing Mr. Andy Walker pass my house uh, with that hat on in that old Ford car that he drove going to the sawmill down in Hefford. And I, I tell this son Tommy about that uh, a lot. Uh, but um, Hefford at one time was a very, very flourishing town. It had sawmill, it had cotton gins, uh, it had uh, the LNA Railroad uh, came through and uh, built a railroad through uh, Heflin. And uh, of course, the sawmill used the railroad. And, and as I said, it had a cotton gin. It had five general stores at one time. Uh, Mr. Lloyd Lady, who is here tonight, I'm so proud he's here, 
Uh, he had a, a service station there for many, many years, and uh, it was a it was a, a, a thriving business. Uh, my father, uh, his name was Vander Knowles, Vander P. Knowles, and uh, he was the first mayor of Heffern and served for the mayor, served as mayor for many, many years, and then Mr. Bay succeeded him as, as mayor of Heffern. Uh, but uh, also in, in uh, Heffern, uh, there, was, uh, there was another railroad that I want to call your attention to. And that railroad started in Sydney and it ran down through uh, Yellow Pine and it, it actually served the Long Bell Lumber Company, which operated a big sawmill in Yellow Pine. And it ran down through Yellow Pine and then on down to Ringo and eventually it was extended all the way down to Hall Sunday. And uh, if you know where to look, and I do, you can still see the old of the old, not the tracks, but you can, we call them the dual tracks. You can still see the old railroad bed where that, that railroad ran down through, through the countryside. It stopped at a place not too far from my house, and that place was called Whiskey Junction. And Whiskey Junction is located just as you turn off Franklin Road to go down toward Lake Vistano. And the people who wanted a beverage, and this is in quotes, that was harder than water, got off the Whiskey Junction. <laughs> they had a beverage at Whiskey Junction. And uh, I can remember as a little boy the, 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 the store that was there. Or, and it's gone now, but I can remember as a little more that it was there. Uh, so heaven will flourish for a, a long, long time, and uh, but uh, eventually the railroad uh, uh, ceased to run through heaven. Uh, the the sawmills uh, they they closed up, and uh, most of the businesses uh, are now gone. There's one general store. Left in Hepland. And uh, it's just a little sleepy town. It's a nice little town. Uh, it, has a, it has a long history. Uh, Heffern School, as, as I just alluded to just a few minutes ago, uh, was a wonderful school. Uh, I started school there back in uh, 1948, graduated in 1960. Uh, feel like I got excellent education. I got a wonderful education. Uh, and, uh, as I, it must have served me well because somehow I managed to, as a little country boy, I, I managed to go on to LSU and, and graduate from uh, Louisiana State University. And uh, I tell my girls, and they, they still don't believe it, but in 1960, when I went to LSU, I got on a train in Linden. I had two suitcases, and that's all I had. I got on a train in Linden, and I rode to Baton Rouge, got off. Started to perish. So uh, that's the that's the history of the, of the town of Um Well, uh, I hope that uh, I have enlightened you a little bit about our family history, and uh, we do still live on the same state. Uh, Judy and uh, we've raised uh, five girls there, and uh, we, uh, we we just that's our home. We've been there a long, long time, and I hope uh, somebody will come along and, and uh, continue to live there in, in years to come. But, uh, okay. Uh, you want me to blow the horn? <laughs>
alive back here? <laughs> I don't think so. Well, at that time, I was an LTI. <laughs> So you want everyone to go against that? Yeah, well, 